All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming and hanging out with us for a little bit. My name is Kendall Berry. I'm the one of the advocate managers uh, with CASA of Central Virginia, and I serve in Appomattox County, Campbell County, and some of Lynchburg. I handle some of Lynchburg cases as well. Um, and I, you could, I serve in the capacity of advocate manager. Um, for those who are not familiar with CASA, we are court appointed special advocates, our mission, and we are appointed by judges in the JND court or the juvenile and domestic relations court uh, to serve children that are abused or neglected or at risk of abuse and neglect. Um, our mission is to advocate for safe and permanent homes for the, the children that we are appointed. And we find that in a, the vast majority of our cases, we will encounter substance abuse and mental health or, or combination of the two. So tonight uh, we will go over uh, those two issues. We will be discussing those two issues and hopefully it will bring some clarity to us um, and help us to better advocate for uh, these families that are going through those two issues. Um, tonight our present, our Presenter is Rebe Rebecca McClellan. I'm going to give you a brief bio on her. She currently serves as the Drug and Behavior Management Instructor, instructor at the University of Lynchburg in the Department of Health Promotion. She has a BA in Psychology with a minor in Biology from Rutgers University. She has a Master's in Public Health and with a concentration in Global Health. And she has almost completed her doctorate in education and health professions. Um, she is a certified Red Cross uh, first aid uh, person for opioid overdoses uh, and adult, child, adult or child CPR. Um, and she is a certified health education specialist. So we were so fortunate to get her to come share with us tonight on mental health and uh, substance abuse. Um, and how it impacts the family. Um, this is part one of a two-part two mini-series, and the second will be um, on March the 18th at six o'clock on the same platform. And feel free, if you not, have not already done so, to register for that. Um, a little housekeeping, we're gonna ask everyone to stay muted. Um, Ms. Rebecca does like to um, be interactive in her instruction. Um, so feel free to use the chat box to put in um, any questions you may have as they arise. And also I ask you to put your email address in the chat box if you would like to have certification for this, for your participation in this training. And we will get those out to you as soon as we can. Um, and without further ado, I introduce to you um, Ms. Rebecca McClellan. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry for my background. I was supposed to still be in my office at the college, uh, but my sister, uh, I had to stick her in an ambulance and send her to the hospital today. So I am actually at home. Um, we're going to go through two series of slides. The first is going to be about mental health and substance abuse separately as well as together. And then the second one is going to be on factors related to substance abuse. So let's see, Kendall, are you gonna go ahead and share the slides? Um, do you not have them up? Well, you just shared your screen, so I just- I just, no, I wanted you to be able to, okay, so. so Stop the share then, go ahead. Uh, it says the host disabled. Uh, That's what I was doing, I was enabling oh. it. I, Kelly? I just made you a co-host, Rebecca, so you should be able to Okay, now. all mm. right, good. Kendall, you just have to stop sharing yours. Okay, all right, there we go. Okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's see, I can share. All right, let's see what we've got going here. It should. There we go. Oh, 
me. I apologize. I do not use, we use Google. Oh, let's see. Are you guys seeing the big slides? My students are always like, no, I can never see the big slides. So I just want to make sure. I don't see anything now. I don't see I anything. See I did. All right. Just want to make sure. As it takes my little notes away, if not. All right. Let me see if I can blow it up and share it back with you. I apologize. All right. <clears throat> all right. There we go. All right. Can you all see the big, <laughs> the big PowerPoint now? Awesome. Yes. All right. So this one is the mental health and substance abuse. There we go. So we're going to go over a little terminology first. So we need to understand the difference between substance abuse and substance or yeah, substance abuse or drug abuse and drug misuse, because these are not the same thing. So drug misuse is unintentional. The person does not mean to do it. This could be someone taking a prescribed medication, say they took a fluid pill, thinking that it was a headache medicine. That is misuse. Or if you take too many ibuprofen because you think that that is the correct dose, but it's not, that is misuse. However, drug abuse, that's intentional. The person is trying to achieve a certain either feeling or get the effect of it. And this has consequences. Misuse may have consequences, but drug abuse does. We need to discern the difference between any mental illness and serious mental illness, because I will refer to both of them during the uh, presentation. Uh, a comorbid condition. So I just think of co as like two, and then morbid just means that they're gonna be together. And so this is gonna be two disorders or illnesses that are existing at the same time uh, in some people, you will actually get more than two, and it would be three, sometimes four. It frankly just depends. So in drug addiction, I want to be clear that whether you agree with me or not, usually I would say, oh, I hope everyone agrees. No, I'm going to be clear. Drug addiction is a disease of the brain. This is not a choice. This is a very literal disease. Drug use is a choice. Drug addiction is not. So what does mental health have to do with it? So mental health has so much to do with it. That's the thing. One in five adults per year experience mental illness. And then you'll see one in 25 experience serious mental illness. I looked up the most recent statistic and it's one in six children. So one in six ages between six and 17 are going to experience a mental health illness or disorder in a year. That is about 7.7 .7 million children that are going to suffer from some sort of mental illness. And you can see that the prevalence in this is not just Caucasians. It is not just white Americans. You see Asians, Blacks, Hispanics, you have American Indians, people of mixed or multi-races, and then individuals that may identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual are suffering more than others. Does anyone have any questions? If you do, what I want you to do is, if it's a question on this slide or this specific topic, go ahead and stop me now. If it's more broad or you have a bigger question, you wanna save it till the end and then I'll be definitely sure to go over it. 
So this is prevalence of any mental illness in the past year. This is just a different depiction of it so that you can see males and females alike are suffering, the adults, because that is, in this case, in this scenario that we're talking about, adults are the ones that are creating the situation of potential neglect or abuse. A child doesn't usually, I can't even think of a scenario where a child is creating that. So that's why we're discussing adults first, because mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, somebody is suffering and this is their reaction. So we have a tremendous amount. I mean, 18 to 25, like 26%, 22%, for a large majority of the population. But let's look at Virginia's mental health statistics. So, whoop, oh, now it's moving on, it's on good. 17 in Virginia alone. I do wanna add that Virginia has almost no true statistics on mental health. It, when I mean I searched high and low, I, it was pulling teeth to find this. So this is an approximation. In Virginia, 17, that's almost 20% of adults in Virginia are suffering from any mental illness. But then we go on and we see adolescents, adolescents 12 to 17, they're suffering at 14%. And this is for depression. However, in Virginia and in the United States, they found suicide is now the leading cause of death for individuals with a comorbid mental illness and substance use. So that means that out of all of the individuals that are dying, who are suffering from anxiety, depression, uh, borderline personality disorder, bipolar, schizophrenia, and substance use disorder, suicide is the leading cause of their death now. Virginia is very, very close to the national average for the suicide rate, which is an absolute shame. What is the issue here? With mental illness, the problem is there's a discrepancy in services and treatments that are even available to be provided. Out of all of those individuals that I was saying in Virginia that are suffering from major depressive episodes uh, or any mental illness, 56% of them didn't receive treatment. Well, why? Why are they not receiving treatment? Not, I'm not even saying treatment for substance abuse. We're saying treatment for mental illness. They're not receiving it because there's lack of access to care. It's, it's very, it's plain. And we're saying that these people are uninsured, underinsured, or living in a community of color. Maybe they live in the very, very tip of Virginia where like Wise, Big Stone Gap, places you guys may have never heard of, Norton, Grundy, you know, they may live in those places where when I was there, there was a Walmart and I don't even know where the doctor was. And I lived there. So this is a huge issue. In the US, so co-occurring and comorbid, we're gonna say those are the same thing. We know there's millions of people on this planet, but in America alone, you see eight and a half million are living with a co-occurring mental health disorder and substance use disorder. It tells you, it gives you an idea of what that looks like. I don't know if anyone's ever been to New York City, but there is just a mass of people. It is roughly the equivalent of the entire population in that city. And out of those eight and a half million people, 8.3% are actually receiving the appropriate treatment that they need. Are we starting to paint a picture of why this might be an issue? Why people are suffering 
why adults are suffering in particular, and then in turn, their children or the children around them, people in their family suffer as well. Because if you can't take care of yourself and you don't know how, and you don't know what to do, you can't take care of someone else. So now we're gonna look at some of the effects of that. So they do a youth behavior risk survey every year. So the one with the most complete data is the last one that I used. Some of these, I was like, well, this is kind of low. And then I thought about how many students, how many children are in Virginia. 16% of high school students are saying that they were using tobacco or nicotine in the last 30 days. Marijuana, 17%. One or more times, not just saying, oh yes, I smoked a single cigarette. If someone tells you that, I think they're lying. I just want you to know. So 33% of high school students and now middle school students are using the e-cigs, vapes, hookahs, vape pens, mods. They look like, um, oh gosh, what are they called? Like flash drives. They come in all shapes and sizes. They will tell you they're holding it for somebody else. They're not holding it for anybody. They're holding it for themselves. Their left hand is holding it for their right hand. It, it's not someone else's. However, high school students are also reporting that they're drinking at least one drink of alcohol in the last 30 days. I compared that to adults. Adults in Virginia, 56% reported drinking at least one drink of alcohol in the last 30 days. And then not only are we saying that high school students are drinking, but now we're gonna go into binge drinking. So binge drinking is literally defined as for a woman more than four drinks in an hour and for a man more than five. So 12% of high school students. So we're talking individuals that are anywhere from, we'll go 14 to 18, usually like 15 to 18 are binge drinking at least one time in 30 days. And if they're doing it at least once, they're probably doing it more than that. So now we're gonna look at the the gravity behind mental illness and substance use and substance abuse because Virginia, they may do a poor job of reporting mental health, but they do a great job of reporting overdoses. So as you see, each of these is a year. The little colors are just each quarter so they all make up an entire year. We don't see this going down. When I collected this, you can see that it was only the second quarter of 2020. And look at the difference, the sheer difference in overdoses in 2020 when COVID hit compared to 2019. It was almost already the same. Virginia's reported a 67 percent increase in fatal drug overdoses in 2020 compared to 2019. This difference came from, it was a 9.4 percent increase from 18 to 19. 19 to 20 is at least a 67 percent increase. Now this, I'm putting this in front of you because I don't, I know this is the central Virginia um, CASA, but I want us to reflect because just because we're in central Virginia, which actually, you know, our color's not that deep of a yellow, but we still have a problem. We have a very clear problem. Fentanyl, heroin, meth, and opioids have increased in our area. People are using them and people are dying from them at greater rates. <clears throat> the rate of death for fentanyl went up 56% last year. The rate of fatal overdose for Coke went up 9%. For meth, went up 56%. P 
people are using harder and harder drugs in our areas. So we need to be aware. So now that we've addressed substance abuse and we're saying, hey, we have a problem. We have a problem with depression and anxiety and bipolar disorder and borderline personality disorder and schizophrenia and people aren't getting help. So then their families suffer. How do you know? That's, that's our next question. How do we know? How can we identify a child, perhaps identify the adult? And so that's where we're gonna be heading into next. So I'm gonna pull up a different set of slides for you. See if I can get out of that. So does anyone have any questions just about overall the mental illness factor coupled with substance abuse and use disorder um, or even from our area? I was gonna say, cause we can hang tight or I can keep plugging along. Well, I don't have a question per se, but this morning as I was getting ready for the day, I was I'm always watching the news and they re they reported that um, self-mutilation has increased during this pandemic, that they're seeing more teenagers, more adolescents are cutting themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the perfect breeding ground. Um, we're still in, some people are still in isolation. And that is the perfect breeding ground for substance for covering up substance abuse or use um, and mental health issues. Absolutely, because not only are people not leaving their homes. Well, in a situation where a child was already in danger, you already know someone has said like, "We really need to look out." Well, now they can't leave. Before, where could a kid go to school? Maybe they were in, with a church group. Maybe they had a friend that they could that they were going to hang out with. Well, they're not going to anybody's house anymore. Probably not during COVID. They're not probably not going to school. If they are, it's not a normal schedule. And if their parents are vastly unreliable due to their habits, then they're probably not going to school. They are probably the student that may not have picked up their Chromebook. They are the student that may not have finished last year, but got pushed to the next grade anyways. They are the student that is falling behind. And although these school systems, they really do their best to say there is no child left behind, children are left behind because there's so many and we need to look out for them. So we're gonna look into, let's see, the factors that are going to relate to substance abuse. All right, is my big slide up now? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go over the factors that are gonna relate to it. Well, first you have to understand why does someone use drugs? So, so many reasons, almost, if I ask this on an exam, uh, I don't think I've ever taken points away because I don't really think, I mean, unless it's just a silly answer, that it's wrong. People are going to use drugs because they're interested. They might be experimenting. Well, someone said that this made them feel that way, so I wanna see how it's gonna make me feel. Or they're seeing other people use. Well, the more you're in an environment where that's being done, the more you're going to lower your inhibition of saying no, no, one day you're going to be so sick of saying no that you're going to say yes. Some people are curious. I just want to know. Self-medicating, maybe they're in pain, maybe they don't want to feel anything. Maybe something changed in their life. They lost a job, someone died, maybe a worldwide pandemic hit. They can't leave their homes. They don't know what to do. They're cooped up inside. They haven't seen their family. Grandma has passed away now. 
all of these things are happening, I don't know where to turn. They are experiencing mental health disturbances. But there's some people that really just love the way it makes them feel. Because with hard drugs, your first high is your best high. Your first high is your best high and it is the high that drug addicts chase that they will never achieve again. That's a big factor into why people overdose because they're taking more and more thinking more of it will get them back to that first feeling that they had and it will not. Sensation seeking means these people are numb. This is someone that they wanna feel anything they don't care what that anything is. That could be pain, that could be adrenaline, that could be absolute fear. They want to feel something because it's been so long since they felt anything. So you have so many reasons why they use drugs. But when use turns into abuse can be the first time that they do it. Because if you are predisposed as an individual your genetics somewhere along the line say, we like that. It doesn't matter what it is. Because I'm gonna ask you guys, what can you be addicted to? I was gonna say, I'll open up my I was gonna say literally anything. It could be like TV or sugar. Absolutely. Anything. Yeah, absolutely anything. You can be addicted to exercising, not exercising, shopping, eating, a certain food. Uh, sex. A certain, yeah, the, literally gambling, sex, uh, binge watching TV is an addiction if you can't stop. You know, there's all of these things. So we're not saying, you know, oh, well that person, it's no one in their family's ever been addicted to drugs. Yeah, but did anyone ever have excessively used something? You know, was grandpa a, a closet gambler? You know, was somebody, you know, a closet alcoholic? Things that we don't think about as addictions because they don't change the world and change families as much outwardly. Skip to my next slide here. So now we need to talk about risk factors. So risk factors for youth drug abuse. We're talking the things that you can see. These are anything from how they're behaving. Is a child aggressive? Are they acting out? Are they behaving recklessly? Do they just not give a crap ever? It doesn't matter what happens, they don't care. Are they, there's some children that sit there and they just, nothing phases them. They've got a bad attitude. They don't care about school. They don't care about you. They don't care about their family. They don't, they don't want to do anything. They don't wanna be here. You've also got other factors. These you may see, you may see in very young children, but you also may see as an adolescent. The adolescent then pulls themselves away. They isolate themselves. They may even become violent if provoked. And this is someone that, although they're isolated, is probably being bullied. These children may suffer from poor mental health, common ones in children that are at risk for drug use and abuse are gonna be ADHD, which is a very widely known one, ADD, anxiety and depression. A big one that should make some sense. If your family has used, you may use as well because it changes things. No one in my household growing up was using drugs or drinking. So I wasn't around it 
being conditioned that, well, it's not that bad. If everybody here is doing it, it's not that bad. I was not conditioned that way. However, people that grow up in that situation are. They, the other potential is when a child is born addicted to drugs. The not so nice term are crack babies. These are the babies that come out because mom has been using drugs during her pregnancy and hard drugs cross the placental barrier. So the baby is born addicted to drugs and they have to go through detox. It's the neonatal abstinence syndrome. One of the ways that they treat babies is a lot like they have treated individuals for drugs in the past. They give them drugs. They rank them on a scale and they wean the baby off of drugs. And then if a risk factor is having a poor apathetic uh, family, TLC, tender loving care, is something that helps protect the baby and pull them out. Your environment. If you live in an area where maybe there's violence, maybe there's gangs, maybe it's just kind of run down. Maybe not a lot is going on. You're not that involved. There aren't activities. There's no fair. There's no sports that you're, you know, as a child getting into. That is a high risk situation. The more you're around it, the more you do not see that line. In your mind, everybody uses drugs and that's just how it is. So we say risk factors, but a child in a high risk situation can have protective factors too. And these can weigh, outweigh actually the risk factors. So protective factors like the child uh, exhibits self-control. They don't fly off the handle at everything. They are okay if life changes. They, you know, they kind of roll with it. They have good relationships. They have a parent, whether that is a primary parent or if this is a grandparent that's supporting them, showing them right from wrong or monitoring them. You have a curfew, you know you need to be in. Well, kids don't really go outside that much anymore, but for me it was when the street light turns on, you better get inside. That is parental monitoring. These students want to excel. They want to be good in school and they will be. My sister is a recovering drug addict. My niece, I picked up from a crack house where my sister was arrested. However, my niece, while both of her parents were in jail and everything was going on, not once did her grades fall from an A. She loved school, she was still going, she was sure. It was, it was her thing. So that was a protective factor. When she had the familial risk factor, the environmental risk factor, she had things going against her, but she had some positive relationships. She, we've regained the parental monitoring and support, academic competence. So in my mind, now, now I see, it, see the level of risk coming down for her. Like she's getting more of the things that children need in high risk situations. They need the things that are gonna pull them away from that. Anti-drug policies, we're talking like in schools, but in some places, in inner cities, um, in really tiny, like backwoodsy mom and pop uh, kind of towns, even if there's a policy in place, in a really small place, there might not be that many police officers monitoring these policies. In an inner city, there may be so many people that it's almost impossible to monitor, you know, going into the schools and things like that. 
a strong neighborhood attachment. This is not necessarily, it can be your literal neighborhood, the street you live on, you the cul-de-sac, the whatever, you know, but this is also your group. I grew up playing soccer. So I had a strong attachment to the, the 11 girls that I played with year round. It was us and it was us year round. We always knew we were always together and that's how it was. That's a strong neighborhood attachment. Another factor that's gonna go toward the positive is there's some cultures that are different from the culture I grew up in, which was like, all right, so it's you, mom, dad, and your siblings in your home, that's it. Well, in a Mexican culture, it is customary for individuals to get married, but still everyone is still living in the same home. So the wife's mom and dad are living there. Well, now the husband and wife are living there and then they're gonna have their kids there and everyone is going to be there. That is a strong ethnic or cultural background. That is a family, that is a support system. You are being watched at all times. It's hard to go off the path when someone's always with you. So we're gonna do characteristics of a child either in a situation where they're at risk or they're already using drugs. You will see if the situation goes from, wow, this is something we need to watch to this is not good. This is, this is something that we need to change today. They go from at risk to it's risk. It's there, it's already happened. These children usually exhibit a major behavioral change. Say that they were fine and now all of a sudden they're acting out in class. They're not completing their homework. They are throwing themselves on the ground, they're crying. They're not coming to class, they're talking it back. They're doing all these things. Then you have kids like my niece who in elementary school was making excuses for her mother. When she would be out all night with her, running the roads till three and four in the morning and bringing my niece to school, dirty, not, not fed, without shoes. And my niece would at six, seven, eight, make an excuse of why that this was okay or why that happened. A child may exhibit a weight loss or weight gain. So it's going to depend. Weight loss could be they're actually like huffing or uh, the inhalants, doing inhalants. Weight gain could be a coping mechanism or they've started doing a drug that stimulates your appetite. Poor hygiene, like I was saying, give an example with my niece. Self-hygiene, so children, it's hard because that's the age where you're teaching them what hygiene looks like. Well, if that stops and their clothes are dirty and they're dirty and their hair's not brushed and things along those lines, we've got a red flag. We need to, we need to watch this. And then bruising. Bruising should make sense because we're talking physical abuse or they're in a situation where maybe they're not being abused, but it's secondhand. They were in the way of an abuse that's going on. However, people who use drugs may also bruise due to the drug, whether it's because they're injecting or because you become more easy to bruise when you're doing some drugs. Physical signs, you may see that they have sores. It would be around their mouth uh, or their nose because some drugs, they're going to snort. Your nose and your mouth are huge areas for children to do inhalants. They have whippets. They have, uh, when I was growing up, it was like the keyboard dust off that people were huffing. And 
It can cause nosebleeds. Imagine that if you're just putting all sorts of crap up your nose all the time, you might get frequent nosebleeds. Well, nosebleeds aren't really normal. So if you're seeing anything like that, we've got, we've got a problem. If a child clearly smells of aerosols, so you know, you, everybody knows when you spray something, regardless of the scent, it's got that after smell and you're like, somebody's been spraying something in here, that smell. Just like behavior, changes in attention. If a student goes from being attentive to they're out to lunch, we have a problem. We have a potential problem. And because of attention and behavior, potential changes in school performance overall. These are things that we need to be looking out for. Maybe they don't wanna do their homework anymore. Maybe they're not coming to school. They're not performing well anymore. Now, characteristics of a resilient child. So we've done risk factors, we've done protective factors, and then we did what a child that's at risk might look like. Well, now I'm gonna give you the good news that children are incredibly resilient. So if you can get them out of the situation and sometimes, frankly, sometimes even when they're in the situation still, they may exhibit characteristics that are hopeful, that, that it's not like, oh my gosh, like this kid has seen so much, what are we gonna do? These are those things. Children that are, resist, are, that are resilient tend to be funny. Well, my niece thinks she's hilarious. Like she cracks herself up all the time. I don't think she's that funny. And I tell, I'm like, you're not, you're not, that's not funny. And she's like, oh, you know, yeah, it is. You know, it is. So they have a great sense of humor. These children, because of what they've gone through, may tend to be empathetic just really caring and can feel for someone. They can adapt to change. If something is changing in their life, it's okay. They're gonna roll with it because they are, they're okay with it. Change happens, it's okay, we're gonna keep going. Might take them a second to adjust, but it doesn't just halt their life. These kids want to do well. If you see a child that is either in or taken out of a high risk situation and they start to excel in school and they are laser focused on it. Great, that is a factor of a resilient child. Children who are resilient also have a high self-esteem or confidence. And granted, there's a caveat to that because I have to disagree with it a little bit because I don't believe I mean, granted, if somebody here has high self-esteem all the time, tell me your, tell me how. Because I mean, like, holy smokes, you know, some days you just don't have a good day. But for the most part, they're pretty confident. They're confident in, in themselves and their performance. They are active either with their friends or in things that they like. They have those things. Whereas a disengaged at-risk child probably doesn't even feel that they can have something that they like or like to do or an activity or anything like that. And resilient children are going to exhibit a level of self-control that the world doesn't end just because X, Y, and Z just happened. They are able to be upset, but keep going. Granted, it's like us, us in the car. Well, okay, I won't say us, me in the car. Most of the time, it's fine. But really, if I've had a bad day and then it's just the one thing and I'm like, I went to school in Jersey. So I'm like, what are you doing? You know, the very Italian, what are you doing? I lose a little self-control. Everyone does sometimes, but these kids, this paints a picture of what factors a child can have even if they've been in a really rough situation. A big one, disengaged from dysfunctional family environments. They may live in that environment, 
but they've got nothing to do with it. If it's a teen, they're like, nope, goes to school, does their thing, room. All right, next day, same thing. They might live, they might live in a trap house, but they're not part of the trap house. So, are there any questions I can answer for you? I try to keep it to a digestible portion so that it's, you know, short enough to make sense, short enough to have questions, but about the same amount of time as a <laughs> lecture. <laughs> wanted to um, first, my first question would be, and it's about substance use. Um, do you see a major change coming with the statistics once, uh, or have you noticed a change in the statistics uh, in those states where they have already legalized marijuana? Or should we, I mean, is it still the gateway drug? Is it, what exactly are we, you know, do we need to be prepared to deal with? I think that that's a fantastic question. And it's one I actually am going to be asking my students next week because I, I have them do debates and I have them pick either opioids or cannabis and take a stand. Right, wrong, you love it, do you hate it? What do you think? Improve it. I, I tell them, I don't care what you think. I just want to know what you think. So for teens, the gateway drugs actually are going to be tobacco alcohol. and alcohol. Alcohol. Yep. Absolutely. Granted. I'm a therapist at a detox. And okay. whenever I do my PSAs, 98% of them, when I asked what was the first thing they ever did, it was alcohol every time almost. So, and the thought behind that. So why did teens abuse or why do teens why is tobacco one of them? Why is alcohol one of them? Because they're accessible. They're in their parents' uh, bathroom. They're in the, in the cabinet. Absolutely. That is a huge factor. That is a huge factor. Mom's got a cabinet full of pills. Well, I'm going to have a great time like she does. Mm -hmm. Mom takes them. Why can't I? I see what happens to mom. Actually, I'd love, you know, they're like, forget it. I had a bad day. I'm going to do it too. Alcohol is there. And kids think they are so smart and like, well, we can just refill the bottle, of, you know, which pour it back and blah, blah. And like, I taught high school, or not taught, I coached high school soccer in Jefferson Forest. And the things that I learned from my 12, 13 through 18 year old players was, holy crap, for one, because I'm like, why, what are you guys doing? you know they're sneaking out and they're getting drunk every weekend and they're now still having parties during covid and the parents are allowing it and it's because it's there as for marijuana it has medicinal use so we have that factor that it very literally does come in tablet form it's one example of that it's called marinol and they give it to cancer patients mm -hmm. because we want cancer patients to eat and a cancer patient usually does not feel like eating. There has not been a huge influx because frankly, I thought, I thought it would be like, oh, it's legal, off to, you know, everybody's doing it. It was not the increase that I, you know, I expected like this to kind of be like, oh yeah, well, I'm doing it. And then it be like, I don't know, tenfold. It wasn't. It was only a few percent in some of the places. So do, I don't show my cards to my students, but do I agree that it should be legalized in some capacity? But my concern is that that's not where we're going to stop because Oregon this past election decriminalized for adults and youth, heroin, cocaine, uh, let's see, meth, 
opioids and marijuana already was. So we're saying that an individual, if they are caught with coke, heroin, meth, fentanyl, anything on them, they will not be penalized. And is that telling them it's okay? That's the question. If you decriminalize it, is it telling them that they're never gonna get in trouble for it then? And that's the biggest problem here. And marijuana could, can be a gateway drug, but it's going to be a gateway drug for someone who wasn't gonna stop anyways. There's some people that they're like, oh no, I'm gonna, they're gonna take one hit per day or you know, whatever, and they're good. That's just them. I have, I have an old coworker. She has had like 37 surgeries in her life. And she's like, some nights I just can't sleep. She was, she, and she's like, I take one single hit and I can go to sleep. She's like, and I feel, you know, and I've got relief, but she doesn't have kids in her house. You know, kids, kids aren't there to know. So is it a gateway drug? It can be. You know, I would say that for my sister, someone clearly predisposed to doing drugs and hanging with not great crowds and putting herself in that situation, absolutely. It was marijuana and then it was marijuana and some drinking. She hated drinking. So then she was doing, she was uh, doing Coke and then she was doing crack. And then when Coke and crack weren't good enough, she was snorting meth and she loved it. So that's the thing is it's going to be more about the person because there's some people that are in like Rikers for like a joint. Mm. And is that fair when Rikers is full of like murderers and like child molesters and like the worst people that we could imagine in our lives? No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not, you know, if that's, the one joint that they were going to have that week, you know, that's kind of up to, you know, everyone to hold their opinion. So gateway, yes and no. And the only way for us to really discern it is to look at the person and their situation. If the parents are doing it, maybe that's how they started or you know it's in the house, or it's in the, in the environment, and now mom and dad are kind of doing worse? Probably. It's there. Somebody's going to do it. Okay. Can we talk a little bit about substance abuse or substance use and mental health combined? We got both of those issues going on at the, excuse me, at the same time. Yeah. So... You have the factor where someone's using and then they're exhibiting mental health problems. Um, some drugs can cause like more so schizophrenia um, or like persistent hallucinations and things like that. Yeah. And, but what we're looking at more is people who are already suffering, because we saw that a huge percent of the population is. So this is not to say that every person who suffers from mental illness will use drugs. No, that's not true. You know, my, my mom suffers very severely uh, from mental illness and there is no way on this planet she would get near drugs, but People who are suffering to that degree and using drugs are doing it for a myriad of reasons. They may want to escape because it's awful. The way they feel is terrible and there is nothing that they can do to get out of it. So the drug makes them feel, they get high. There is a euphoria. They felt something, they felt pretty good. 
and then usually there's a, a group you have you have friends and you're using with them so you have your you have a community you built this kind of family but someone who is addicted to drugs and suffering from a mental illness only cares about getting more drugs. They want drugs. And I'm telling you, someone who wants drugs will do literally anything. I picked my seven-year-old niece up from a crack house with four child molesters inside. My sister left her there. My sister sold all their belongings to buy more drugs. They will do whatever it takes. It doesn't matter if you're their mom, their sister, their kid, the worst person on this planet. They will steal, they will sell their belongings, they will do whatever it takes. I had my students watch uh, the Netflix series Dope, the first season episode two, and it was an example in Baltimore. And the uh, one was a drug dealer. The other scenario was uh, a couple who were drug addicts addicted to heroin. And then the other was police and it was a documentary. And the uh, drug dealer, he goes, he said, people do anything for this. He goes, I don't care what happens to them. I want my money. And he goes, I've had people ask me if, I'll have, if, uh, if I wanna have sex with their kids so I can get more drugs. People will do anything. And it's because they can't see anymore. Go ahead. I'm actually in recovery. And um, I get that question all kind of, a lot. I get a bunch of different questions because I'm one of the only people, I think I'm the only one at the detox. Our, the way our work is set up is we have a detox and then we have the, the psych. And a lot of times I get the site, the, we try to keep them separate, but a lot of times they're on the same hall, but um, I'm in recovery. So they give me a lot of, of uh, the ones detoxing. But I was just curious as to how, like we have a lot right now with the mojo and psychosis. And it's very strange to me that we had an influx last year of LSU students, all of them about freshman, sophomore year, but they were all from out of state, every single one of them. So I'm like, I'm telling the doctor, cause he's asking me, what do I think it is? I said, I think somebody is targeting these people who don't have any connections here. And they're giving them either half mojo, half weed, or just straight mojo because they don't have any connection here. I said, so I think that's, what, I think that's what's going on. And they're good kids. You know, they're engineer uh, majors. They smoke it one time and they're in short psychosis. Once they come down and it's like days before they come down, their parents are just in shock that they even tried it. But the only thing in their system is weed. Right. So it, it's just, it's crazy uh, to me because when I got sober, they didn't have no Joe Spice was one of the first things that um, I, I found my clients doing. And I didn't know what it was. I just knew they were ducking off in groups. And I told my clinical director, I said, these, they're high. And we kept drug testing, kept drug testing. And this was, I've been sober 13 years, so it was a while back. And um, they kept saying, no, their, their talks are coming back clean. Their talks, I'm like, I'm telling you, they are high because they're triggering me. They're high, high. And that's when we figured out um, spice was a big thing. And then it was an influx in the bath salt. It's just insane. So Mojo is a synthetic marijuana. So mm -hmm. it's like, it's in the same, they have it in the same category as K2 or spice. Um, this, in some places, you could buy it at like CVS. Oh, the gas station. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's kind of, oh gosh, what's, what do they put on uh, the label? I can't even, what do they say it is? I think it's a potpourri. Yeah, yeah, they're like, oh, it's incense. You're fine. It's not drugs. And so people will use these 
but synthetic cannabis is a designer drug and you have no idea granted you don't always know what's in your hard drugs you have no idea what you're getting and one of the major symptoms frankly of using is persistent psychosis and there is the potential that taking it will result in a forever persistent psychosis not just until it god willing in the sun shines gets out of your system so yeah i mean it's incredible because there's things like that where it's like maybe someone is is targeting students because they like well their parents aren't going to come and kill me here because they're from wherever um mm -hmm. there's also been instances even in like charlottesville where there's bad bad batches um of laced like mostly like meth and heroin going around and then you'll see in the er an influx of overdoses because someone's using maybe the same that they always do it's not the same drug anybody have any other questions I've also seen cases where <clears throat> there's like medications that are prescribed such as like Adderall or Xanax that are being used as um, ways to have like high experiences as well. Do you have any like information on that? Yeah, absolutely. So you've got, so it's, it's horrible, honestly, how many there are. So there's things like over the counters. Teenagers love cough medicine because if you take enough of it, you will hallucinate. It's that simple. You will get high and hallucinate because what is the other reason? Accessibility. Well, granted, now a lot more when you're buying it, you got to scan your license because one of the ingredients of cough medicine is used to make meth. So you have that trade up, but for prescription medication. So Xanax, I actually had, I'm having students, I, they do projects, they pick a drug and they find out everything they can about it. Well, with Xanax, it's, it's interesting because students are taking it due to anxiety. So they're taking it thinking that it's gonna be this quick, like bring me down, pull me back into life kind of thing. Well, then when it doesn't do that, either they're taking more or they're doing it because they took an Adderall in the morning that wasn't theirs. So now they're way, way, way up because it's a stimulant. And now they want to come back down. The only way to come back down, if it's not getting out of your system, is to take a downer. Well, then I'm just going to go ahead and take Xanax and then I'm going to drink alcohol on top of it. And I'm just going to keep on going down. Well, then what do I have to do in the morning? I have to take another upper. Because now, now I'm so far down, I can't get back up. Can't function like this. So yes, prescription medications are an issue. Um, and I would like to express that with Adderall, if the, the appeal is because people believe that every single person that takes Adderall will benefit from it, that it will give you better attention, it will keep you awake longer, it will do all of these things. It, it kind of does, but for someone who has ADHD and is prescribed Adderall, you take it and I take it because I have ADHD because I have had upwards of 20 some odd concussions and brain injuries. So for me, it zones me in. I sleep like a freaking baby at night. I don't stay up for days because of Adderall. I can focus, I can breathe, I can have one thought at, at a time rather than 750 at one time. Whereas someone who doesn't need a drug like that, they're gonna be up. It actually does the opposite to their attention. So students are taking it during finals thinking like, wow, it's gonna keep me up so I can study. No, you're gonna hear Someone's clicking their pen in the library and that's all you can hear. 
Oh, you just heard the door open again. You're not focused. You can't be. It's not doing what it does for someone who needs it. Um, benzodiazepines, kind of downers, antidepressant medication, um, they love them because a lot of college students are on them. However, not all antidepressants or any anxiety medicines, antipsychotics work for every person in the same way. I may take Lexapro and it works great for me. Well, then I have a friend that takes it and they're having suicidal thoughts. That medicine does not work for them. And students don't see the difference. Children, uh, teenagers, they don't see the difference. They just see something like, oh, well, everyone's, you know, doing bars, which is Xanax. Or, well, everyone, everyone takes an Adderall every once in a while. Like, it's okay. Because they're like, well, it's going to keep me up and I'm going to be able to study and take this exam. But it's not exactly how it works. I have a question regarding uh, prescription drugs, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, so what about the combination of something like Suboxone with um, Gabapentin? Oh. Uh, you know, where, where someone is, is combining some medications that are prescribed to them, but are taking them perhaps in excessive doses and uh, producing highs, which affects their mental health. Right. So they're doing it because they like the way it makes them feel. It's simple. They do. However, it's going to get to a point where, it, I'm not gonna say it's going to, I, I don't wanna put that on someone. It has a very high potential to get to a point where the amount that they're doing, it's not enough. When good's not good enough. So they're gonna keep doing more. And then when that drug, when the mixture, like of uh, Suboxone and Gabapentin is not enough anymore, what are they gonna do? They have to, they, well, they're addicted to it now. They're addicted to that feeling and they're going to do what it takes to get back to it. So we've got a situation where you're dancing a very fine line, a very, very dangerous line that you're almost to the tipping point that if we don't have, you know, what I called with my sister, like the come to Jesus moment, that it's like, holy crap, that we're going to go go over the edge and we're going to be using harder drugs or start drug seeking from doctors and it's a uh, doctor hopping and so you go and you're like well I'm going to get this from this guy and then I'm going to get this from this one I'm going to take them all together to see what happens Are there any other questions anybody else has? Um, I don't know. I'm uh, yeah, I do. Out. Sorry. I, I have a Go question. Ahead. I'm sorry. It took me a moment to unmute. Um, uh, I'm a CASA and I have in one of my cases an 11 year old boy who is 260 pounds. He is obese. He is. Um, uh, his family, there was, uh, he was certainly abused um, himself, and he also experienced, he observed a lot of violence between his parents. Um, his parents have come a long way. Um, they are currently in a circle of security therapy to address um, some pretty strong uh, attachment issues. Um, so there is, there is hope for the family. It's a work in progress. In the meantime, um, the boy who... Um, during his foster care has been in two different institutions, uh, facilities, I should say, residential facilities, um, um, was returned home last summer 
um, because the second institution facility had felt like they, it was a short-term facility and they really couldn't do more for him. And, um, and there was no other viable placement for him. And um, it was deemed that he was safe enough to go home. And so he's been home and um, he's in therapy, but the therapist has uh, uh, said he's just not, not willing to talk. He's not interested in therapy. He's a sweet kid. He's not, he's, he's polite and um, will chat. He's very chatty with me. On my visits, ironically, he, he's, you know, when I say, how's it going? He'll tell me all the great food he's eaten recently. So he's really quite, quite folk or, or, or at Christmas time, when I said, how is it to be with your family? You know, great, we ate blah, 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 blah. You know, he's very, very focused on food. And, um, and he's, not, um, he's not interested in therapy. He just, he's, you know, like many teenagers and preteens, he's, he's at a point where he's not, not willing to, uh, to open up like this. And so <clears throat> what I'm, my, my question is sort of uh, wandering, I admit, but, you know, what does, my fear is, um, uh, and there are many, but one of them is as um, he has issues with pair, peers. And so he's been doing okay. Actually, he's thriving on a pandemic high, pre, uh, middle school. He has no peers, you know, he's, he's coping and he's doing very well with school. My concern is when he goes back to school and enters upper middle school, um, you know, the, the, some of those boys, the mean kids are going to eat him up, you know, not maybe that's the wrong metaphor, but you know what I mean? He's, he's a very emotionally immature and very big for his age and he's just going to be a target. And so, you know, what, what does, what does one do for a, um, a child who, because it's, it's overweightness, it doesn't attract the same alarm that drugs use would use. But as you said earlier, it's all addiction. It's all addictive behaviors. When it's something that's, that's not necessarily socially acceptable, but it's socially accepted to, to, be, to be obese. What, what, is the, uh, what is the path to help this child? Particularly because as the children move towards return home, his sister is still in foster care. As the family moves toward uh, 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 reunification as a family, which they're probably going to do in about six months. It's a very poor family. They have very few resources and therapeutic services are going to rapidly disappear. Yeah. Help. So it's hard to do clearly, but how is his relationship with the family now? Like, is, is, is that repairing? Like he's better? It's repairing. They, they certainly have, um, have outbursts. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the mother, the, mo the, the father, um, who's actually his stepdad, the father is, is very intuitive. He's a very sensitive man. Okay. So there's a lot of hope. The, fa the father is the stronger parent. Okay. The mother is, um, was severely abused as a child, severe sexual history, abuse by brothers and father. It's horrible. So the mother, the fact that she gets up in the morning, puts on her shoes is heroic. But meantime, she, um, you know, there's, there's attachment issues for both of her children. And so she, she is a, do you know what circle of security therapy is? Mm -mm. I don't think so. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a phased therapy targeted to, um, to uh, help address attachment issues. You understand attachment, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, 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 it's a, um, a very, very intensive, um, expensive, committed, uh, specialized therapy for attachment issues. And so the, mo and the mother has thrown herself into it. She's approaching phase five, which is great, but she's a work in progress. Right. Um, so, you know, yeah. The thing, so are the parents overweight as well? The mother is. It's going to have to start with them. He's not going to do anything unless the people that he is looking up to are doing it. And it could be as simple as, you know, 
the road they live on the street you know if they live on a street and we can all walk to the mailbox you know and it just it's one it's an activity that they're doing together but it's also the thing that is going to make them better you know the little the little bit of activity or the let's plan like even our meals because his his part of his problem is food is a comfort food mm -hmm. is what he associates as good he asso associates food as a memory food is not food food isn't keeping him alive food is the thing that he loves food food is the food is food is christmas food is my birthday food is happy food is when my mom and i had that really great meal and she was smiling and 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 everybody was happy it's not it was my mom's birthday and she was really happy and and it's usually with a child especially with the attachment issues like you're describing it's going to have to be a family event for you know because if he's not getting the relationship at home then he's not going to want to forge relationships outside of it. Like you're saying, you know, in virtual school, it's fantastic that he's doing great in school. We, that's, you know, that's what we're hoping for, but you're right. He's, kids are mean. And I mean, like, oh my gosh. I, I mean, I, hearing my niece is 11 now and the things that kids say at the elementary school, like, I didn't even, I'm going to tell you guys, I did not know those words in elementary school. So I don't know what these kids are learning, but for him, that family unit, because of the history, is going to be the vital part. That if mom is working on herself and is getting to a point where she's like, you know, mom again, you know, or even mom for the first time showing that she worked toward it may help him want to work towards something and dad being emotionally intelligent and intuitive is huge because they as a unit need to have that awareness of when something happens we need to go ahead and face it deal with those feelings or even if they don't know what they are identify it this is this this one's sadness or like i'm sad because or i'm scared because rather than they more than likely choose food it seems is that that's their that's their thing mm -hmm. oh and the mother will admit it that that's her that's her mother you know that and, and she's sort of adamant about it that it's her that's her maternal instinct it's her right this is what she does Right. her family they they eat you know so yeah. well because it's like you know it's it's comfort yeah. and, and in their situation so i grew up living below the poverty line and so when you're getting food stamps like i buy organic food now i don't buy a lot of it because it's expensive on when you're on food stamps you know people are like well why are poor people overweight because all they can afford is processed food, you're eating boxed meals, it's chips, it's soda, because what is the cheapest thing in the store? The processed, the stuff that you can buy in bulk, the stuff that's really not that great for you. And so that's that's the other, other part of it is that they'd have to, or you know, maybe even, I don't know if there's a service that can like show them how to plan out like two healthy meals a week. And I wouldn't even call it healthy. And don't, and, and with these kinds of individuals, you would never call it a diet. It would just be bonding. Have the son cook with mom or dad, you know, and maybe just add one like green in this time, you know? And cause you know, cause a can of green beans, not that expensive. 
and you know and because it's if that's their thing food might need to be their therapy change change that habit through them getting time together but changing the behavior together that may be the thing that works but he is up for a tough tough road because regardless of age no one gets help nor receives help unless they want it unless it's the the seed in their mind that says i want to do this because you could tell somebody you need therapy till they're blue in the face till you're blue but when does someone actually seek it when they decide that they need it when they decide that there's no other option so putting him in therapy and i mean i think it's great and i think it's absolutely necessary but it's never going to do anything until he realizes that like that person is an ally and it makes you feel better when you just dump it all out okay thanks okay are there any other questions hang on one second where is that chat just and this is from a casa um, that believes addiction is a disease similar to diabetes whether alcohol or drugs and addiction should be treated as a disease and so I definitely do agree with that. Anything to add to that, uh, Rebecca? I absolutely agree. Because it's, it's, it is a disease. Uh, addiction is something you have to think about every day, every single day. Just like someone who's suffering from mental illness. Maybe you're not depressed every day, but do you have to work to try and not get back to that place again every single day? Yeah, because days are hard. And just like with addiction, even for like alcoholism, there are triggers, but drugs very literally change the chemistry of your brain and you still have that want. And sometimes it's not as bad and sometimes it's really bad. And you have to find the things in life that are pointing you in the direction of which you wanna go. But it is, it is a disease you are fighting every single day. That's why they don't say, well, I, it's called recovery. I am a recovering alcoholic. I am a recovering drug addict because no one ever fully recovers that means it's over it's never over mm -hmm. okay are there any more questions anything about uh, mental health anybody want to know i know i do i would like to know when we're working with our cases how do you even start a conversation um, with someone that you know is suffering from mental health issues. Um, say for instance, if you read the psycho psychological report and it says um, that mom, um, mom has issues uh, with attachments to the children, um, that they are not attached to her. She has no um, motherly in instincts or, and she is suffering from, uh, I don't know, I think I read one said that mom's basic, basically was just thinking about herself and she had no interest in, you know, anything to do with her children. How do you even start a conversation um, with someone about those types of issues? So I guess my first question is, are we starting the conversation with mom or are we starting it with the child? With the mom. Because, to, go ahead. To address those issues. Mom, it wouldn't, you have to address it. There's some things that I'm like, don't ever dance around it. 
mental health is one that you have to be strategic. Um, so it would be something, you know, maybe how mom is feeling recently. You know, well, you know, well, how have you been doing? You know, kind of going and, you know, how's, if she's working, how's work? Uh, you know, oh, well, you know, the kids are in virtual school. How's that? You know, I know that's really tough. How's that going? Because, and then, you know, kind of ease into asking questions where she would be kind of a part of that in their lives. Um, you know, because I know my sister is now like on my knees, like, did you do your homework? You know, are you, you go, do you go to class? This and that. So starting with how are you mom? And even going into, well, you know, oh, you know, oh, I saw him, you know, running around and, you know, how are things, you know, how have they been? How are the kids? Just to see if she can even gauge how that's going. Um, but getting to the root of mom's mental illness, uh, where that comes from, why she may not have that attachment is going to be the necessity. You know, so if mom feels very trusting, you know, if you guys have a really trusting relationship, it can start with how are you doing today? You know, and then, you know, if you know if they have family members around or, you know, well, you know, what about grandma or this and that, you know, do you have any siblings and going into that. And if you, usually someone gives you a pretty clear picture how they feel about someone by how they respond about them. So if you're seeing an attachment issue, you know, when you ask about their parent or their siblings, that could be a place, you know, that needs to be explored. But it's, it's difficult because we'd all love to just say, you know, like, I just need you to tell me what's, you know, what's wrong. Well, you know, what happened? But we have to go at it strategically because people close off very easy. Okay. Okay. I know I just chatted to everyone. It's a short survey about tonight's presentation and it's all, it's anonymous, but it just, you know, gives us a idea of some things that uh, we can do to help better serve, um, you know, people that join us for future presentations. So just take a few minutes to fill out that for us, please. Are there any more questions? I will be back in two weeks to finish out the series. We will be talking the next two. So we'll do prevention and treatment. Uh, it'll be, we'll talk about types. Um, and the other one I did specifically as drugs, children in our community specifically. So those are the things we'll go into next. Okay. And Rebecca, I, I did ask you um, if I could share your um, contact information. Absolutely. Um, so I put her email address in the chat. If anyone has any questions, anything that you need to, you know, have clarified, just send her an email and she'll get back to you. Um, is there anything else? Or should we just conclude? Kendall, there's something in the chat. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that one is from Sharon. Okay, Sharon. Let me see, I'll yeah. go ahead and yeah. do it. You yeah. can go ahead and, and ask your question or whatever you chatted in there. Okay, well, <clears throat> Can you, everybody can hear me, I bet. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, I, I just, I appreciated what Diane said so much. And I mean, it seems so, you just want to do something for, for people. And that's what we're in the job of doing, <laughs> finding some solution to their, their terrible situation. But um, at one point, Casa gave a training session on um, a thing called EMDR. I think it has something to do with, I can't find it right now. Look, try to find it on my phone. <clears throat> but it's a type of counseling. And, and for, a, for a time, I think about two years, they had 
they had a grant to, to give this counseling to people. And, you know, oh, there it is. <laughs> Rebecca found that eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And I was thinking maybe this type of thing, especially, it, it's, it doesn't take seven years or you don't have to go to this counseling for the rest of your life. You know, it starts in, I think it, it's the perfect thing to, to get on with your life, you know, to solve your problems and get on with your life. But I was thinking about for the young boy's mother, especially who had so much uh, trauma in her life, because I mean, these things go in chains and somehow we have to break a chain. So, so it doesn't go on forever. <laughs> I have a case right now who's, who was, as a child, she was just sexually abused and just mistreated. And she's a beautiful girl today, but she is about to lose um, her children entirely because she, she can't get out of that, that mindset. She's constantly accusing people of molesting her own children who have four different fathers for four different children. And, um, I mean, it's just tragic that um, we got to be able to do something. So I, I just offer that. Maybe uh, Diane could look into that. I have put all kinds of things on Pinterest, and I would be glad to send it to you. Yeah, I was, I was just looking uh, at EMDR, and so they've done some studies on it. And one that was done, uh, they did it in children and adolescents with PTSD and high anxiety. And uh, it is shown to be a, an effective therapy for children and adolescents, um, as well as in adults, and can be uh, more helpful with those trauma associated with sexual abuse uh, that's more pronounced and complex. So mm -hmm. kind of like in the situation like that, that mom, where hers is, hers is a little more complex, you know? So there, there is hope, yeah. but... It's, it's one of those things where we know that all of these things exist because, and we could change the world, but our community doesn't have them. And it's, it's, it's incredible because they're like, wow, we just want to, we want the community to be better. So we'll do another trail. I'm like, great. You know, some people can't get out of bed because they feel so bad. Like, how about let's build another, like a free, another free clinic, you know, a, a therapy center, something, because we need it. People need the help. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, if you think of any other questions or anything like that. Uh, looking for resources. I keep a little running list. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm going to ask again that everyone please fill out the survey for me. Um, I just posted it again in the chat. Um, it's just a few questions and it's totally anonymous. Um, very simple. You know, just check the box, check the box. So that type of a survey. And I thank everyone for coming tonight. Um, any other burning questions anybody have? No? Okay, well, I thank everyone for coming and I hope to see you all on March 18th, six o'clock again on this same platform. And I do thank you, Rebecca, for coming and sharing a presentation. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. I know I'm kind of long-winded, uh, but I, I appreciate you all being here and the work that you're doing because it's absolutely necessary and it's you, you're doing a great job. I know it doesn't always feel like that, I, but you are, and thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rebecca. All right. Thanks everyone Thank you. Thank you. and fill out those surveys and I'll see you on March 18th. You're welcome.